This week on Quadriga, Morsi takes control. Egypt heading towards fundamentalism. Celebrations in Cairo as President Mohamed Morsi announces he's dismissing the country's top military leaders and taking back executive power. His supporters say the move marks the end of six decades of indirect military rule in Egypt. Morsi says his decision is not personal and serves the good of the nation. But critics fear his ultimate aim is to establish an Islamic state. Your host today, Ali Aslan. Hello and welcome to Quadriga. While the ancient pyramids in Egypt weren't built overnight, and the same is apparently true for Egyptian democracy, as Morsi's decision to dismiss the military leadership is reaching a new level. And what are the ramifications of this decision? That and more we will discuss today with my three guests. Welcome to Hamed Abdel Samad, who is a German-Egyptian political scientist and the author of several best-selling books. Ahmed Badawi, a former journalist. He is currently a research fellow at the Centrum Moderna Orient in Berlin. And Jan Kuhlmann, who is a journalist who has been reporting on events in the Middle East for various publications. Thank you all for being here, gentlemen. Hamed Abdel Samad, Morsi's move, a rather bold and surprising move. Uh, does this indicate the shift from military to civil rule in Egypt? Well, it's too early to judge, but uh, it's good to end the duality that has been taking place in Egyptian politics in the last several months between the military council and the ruler political party. Um, but at the same time, it is uh, also dangerous because we needed this balance just right now between the secular army and the religious Muslim Brotherhood to establish a new democracy, especially at the time that we are writing the constitution. But Ahmed Badawi, some would say, well, this is not only a bold and perhaps surprising move, but also a good one. This is what Egypt needed. This is the move that will take Egypt to the, on the path of democracy. It's a good first step. And we have to remember that uh, the army has been saying all along that they will deliver uh, power to a civilian uh, leader once this civilian leader has been elected. And this is precisely what happened now. So it is definitely a good step. And of course, it is very good that this duality no longer exists. As for the balance, I think the balance will remain, but mostly behind the scenes, the same way it has been over the last, uh, well, at least since 1967. Uh, the army has, is not going anywhere, uh, but now the balance will be done, hopefully, with, within a proper institutional framework. So, Jan Kuhlmann, what has happened here? Morsi has dismissed uh, Tantawi, who headed the military council, and General Sami Anan. Uh, do you think that such a move would have been even possible without some support within the military? No, I don't think so. I'm, I'm pretty sure about that there was something like an agreement between uh, the government, between the, the President Morsi and some certain elements within the military. And I don't think that the power of the military has been cut to such a big extent because uh, there, there must have been something like an agreement. And the new persons in, in power in the military, like the new defense minister, uh, Abdel Fattah Assisi, he was very close to, to Tantawi, who was fired. Uh, so there was an agreement, and the, the, gov uh, the, the military still has a very strong role. It has been cut a little bit, and I think Morsi is in a stronger position now, but this was a very important move. If you want to have something like a civilian rule, if you want to have a civilian president, civilian government, he had to do this uh, at one point. He took his chance. Um, but I, st I still think that there's a balance between the civilian uh, rule and the military rule. So the military still is in a very strong position. And there are some people who are even talking about the internal coup d'etat inside the army itself. Um, and what happened to Tantawi and Anan is basically just the same what happened to Mubarak. So that the army was seizing the opportunity to get rid of Mubarak and his son, um, and the revolution came and they used the revolution to get rid of Mubarak. And the same thing happened again. Now, uh, 
a lot of people in, the, in Egypt are not uh, satisfied with the performance of the military over the last months. And uh, the new government is not satisfied with the performance of the military. And now what happened in Sinai uh, was uh, the last trigger to give the army the opportunity to get rid of the two old dinosaurs who were too old and too sick like in Jurassic Park. Uh, they just needed a last hit to fall, just like Mubarak himself. Of course, with one difference that Mubarak is perishing in prison, while Tantawi and Anan are now advisors to the president, uh, which again goes to confirm that, yes, the army, of course, used the opportunity uh, to renew itself, but at the same time, it also indicates that there must have been some kind of an arrangement, some kind of an agreement, whereby these old dinosaurs uh, are, um, are being protected more or less now in their new role as advisors. And also, we shouldn't forget other moves. Uh, it goes uh, according to the same logic of moves in the Egyptian army. The head of uh, the Navy, the, the Navy, Navy chief, is now the head of the Suez Canal Authority. Another person is the head of the major industrial, uh, military industrial uh, factory company in Egypt. Uh, so the dinosaurs are gone, but I think the military is still there. With one exception, with mm -hmm. one exception, the new defense minister is affiliated to the Muslim Brotherhood. His mm -hmm. uncle um, used to be one of the leaders of the Muslim Brothers in Alexandria. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is um, kind of a new shift mm -hmm. inside the army, away from the secular tradition towards a more religious uh, set inside the army, which is mm -hmm. disturbing the balance that mm -hmm. I've been talking about. Mm -hmm. And before we talk more mm -hmm. about uh, the future of the military in Egypt, uh, I do want to come back to what has been discussed already, the fragile relationship between Morsi and the military and what this move means for the future of Egypt. Let's have a quick look. Egyptian troops carrying out an offensive against militants in Sinai. It was the military's failure to prevent the killing of 16 border guards there last week and the public outrage this caused that gave President Morsi an unexpected chance to sack his top generals. Yet, as these images suggest, Morsi is still trading carefully. Tantawi, seen here receiving an award after his dismissal, has been kept on as an advisor. And in explaining his decision, Morsi was at pains to be conciliatory. He says he did not intend to target certain individuals or embarrass any institutions. He knows it's too early to discount the military. They have a long history of influence and vast economic interests. And it's still far from clear if the new balance of power will hold or if there will be a backlash. Well, before we talk more about the backlash, Jan Kulman, let me ask you, do you think that Morsi used the attacks in the Sinai as an excuse, as a good opportunity, if you will, which he seized upon to get rid of Tantawi? I think so. I think so. I mean, what he did, he had to do uh, sooner or later because uh, he needed to to st strengthen his own, his own power, his own force. He was uh, before... Uh, he fired uh, the top military leaders. He was a kind of weak president. And if he wanted to become a stronger president, if he, want, if he want to have a, a stronger civilian rule, he had to get rid of these people. So he used uh, what happened in Sinai. This uh, was uh, the military at this point was in a very weak situation because uh, it was a very bad performance of the military. So he, he took his chance and he took the right step uh, at the right moment, I think. He took the right steps, says Jan Kulman, Ahmed Badawi. Do you think there will be some backlash from the military, or do you think we've heard the last of Tantawi in this context? Uh, I think this is, this is it for Tantawi and for Anan. They must have known from early on that their time is over. And it's also important to remember that the military in Egypt, this is the best possible position for the military in Egypt. They cannot rule directly. They have no interest in ruling directly. And they have always um, 
stood behind a large political organization because it is only through this large political organization, whether it was the National Democratic Party before or the Freedom and Justice Party now, it is only through this civilian protection that they can focus on two things. They can focus on national security and they can focus on maintaining their economic privileges. And it's also important to point out that these economic privileges are not necessarily going to the pockets of any particular military person. This is an arrangement that started during the time of Nasser and maintained during the time of Sadat in order to give the military a semblance of self-sufficiency and not make it dependent on a very random budgetary considerations. So I think this is the best possible position for the military and I don't think there will be a backlash if we agree with this uh, analysis and also if we agree that there has been a prior agreement uh, between the military and uh, uh, Morsi, then I don't think there will be a backlash. No, there, will, there are some certain interesting questions which, hasn't, which uh, haven't been answered yet. So the question is, what about the military budget? Who's going to decide about the military budget? Is it the president? Is it the parliament? Or is it the military itself? I mean, the military before uh, said we want to decide ourselves about the military budget, which, I mean, doesn't fit to a democratic state. So this is one of the important questions which, which still has to be answered uh, in, the, in the near future. So there's the next fight coming between the civilian ruling, between the civilian government president and the military. So uh, this fight hasn't come to an end yet. You have a new balance now, but uh, uh, it's still going on. And Hamid Abdel Sama, because the budget was mentioned, the military budget, it's no secret that the United States is supporting the uh, Egyptian military with $1 billion in aid each year. Do you think that Morsi's move would have been possible, even feasible, without the approval or at least knowledge uh, on the part of Washington? I don't think that Morsi had to take the permission of Washington to dismiss Tantawi and Anan, but I believe that the certain generals within the army did, who have very good relation to the United States, and uh, the, new pre the new defense minister is having good channels to America, and I believe that this has been already, because you cannot imagine any step taking place within the army without um, consultation, I don't have to say the approval of uh, the United States. And this makes me not believe so much that Morsi is the new Erdogan who is disempowering the army and is the new powerful man on the Nile. It, he is more hoping on the long run for maybe the Pakistani model bringing the Islamists and the army together, which could be a very dangerous development for Egypt and for the region, just like it was a dangerous step for Pakistan and its region. Mm -hmm. So if I understand you correctly, though, the world right now perceives Morsi to be the strong man in Egypt after he dismissed Tantawi. You seem to doubt that. I think the army is still strong, and uh, Tantawi and Anan were two scapegoats so that the army will continue keeping its position in Egypt, its uh, economical privileges that it has. And I think on the short run, nothing will change in that. The army will have its peace, will have its autonomy, and Morsi will appear to the public as the strong man, which is very dangerous for him personally, because he used to use the army as an excuse why things are not going on track, why things are not developing in Egypt, because he doesn't have enough power. Now, he appears to the public as a superman who um, is a revolutionary strong man, and this brings a lot of responsibilities, a lot of expectations of the people. Now people will say, Mr. Mercy, solve the problems, and I don't think that he has this magical step but, that he can solve all the problems that the country is having right now. But Ahmed Badawi, isn't that a good step then, according to what Ahmed Abdel Samad is saying, now Morsi is the one being accountable. Yeah. Isn't that what he wanted all along? Yes, and this is how it should be. And it basically means that uh, he and the Freedom and Justice Party and the government and the new rulers that are now establishing their authority, they will have to be held accountable very soon for solving the problems of the people. Leaving high politics aside, the street 
is still suffering from a lot of problems. There's still a lack of insecurity, uh, there's a lack of security, there are still uh, problems with water, with electricity, uh, with employment. And now maybe the time has come to forget all these political maneuvering at the top with this whole relationship with the army more or less settled, even if only as far as image is concerned. And now maybe is the time to focus on the problems that are affecting the people. So it's very good that this has happened and it's very good that the people start holding the government accountable. The problem is that the political maneuvering hasn't come to an end yet. Uh, we don't, or Egypt doesn't have a new constitution yet. So it's completely unclear. Uh, who will decide about the new constitution? You have something like an assembly, but it's it's not clear yet if they really have the power to to give the country a new constitution. You don't have a parliament. I mean, we had free elections in Egypt, but uh, the parliament doesn't work anymore. So they have the, the executive power and the legislative power you have in the hand of the president, and the military still plays uh, its part in the whole process. So I think this is, it has been, or it was the right step, which Morsi did, but it was only the first step. I mean, there's, there are still so many other steps to come before you really can take care of the real problems, of the economical problems of, of Egypt, of the social problems. And the first step would be that you have a new parliament or that the old parliament, which has been elected in free elections, is allowed to work. And the next step is as soon as possible, uh, you need a new constitution and, and then you can really uh, can you can take care of the real problems of Egypt. And before we talk more about the constitutional challenges that lie ahead for Morsi, I do want to ask Hamid Abdel Samad, because you do travel frequently to Egypt. How is this move being perceived back in Egypt? How is the media reporting on the dismissal of the military leadership? I think the reception among the majority of people was positive, just like the removal of Mubarak from power. So uh, very few people would say that's wrong because uh, everybody knew that uh, the leadership of the army is not fitting to the army and it's not fitting to the political situation in Egypt. Everybody knew that Tantawi was a man of Mubarak and he was very fidel to him until the last moment, until he seized the opportunity to get rid of him and his son. So there was no um, disapproval among the people. And that's a strange situation that we are having in Egypt right now, that the people are liking nobody anymore. The people on the street are not liking the revolutionary camp. They are not liking the Muslim brothers. They were not disappointed at all as the military council kicked the parliament away with the Muslim brother majority. And the people are not liking the leadership of the army. So this is a situation which is very new in Egypt that you don't have one group which is getting the approval of the majority of the people. So a general distrust of all institutions, if I understand you correctly. But we have talked to some people on the street about this move, about Morsi's dismissal of the military uh, leadership. Let's have a look at what the people on the street in Egypt had to say. So it was the right decision because actually we were waiting for this since long time, especially that uh, um, uh, the president um, uh, Mubarak, uh, he, he is, uh, who is the person who hired uh, Santawi and Anand, and because he hired uh, them, so they're still from the old regime. It can be said that starting today the country is no longer under military rule. Military rule is now over and Egypt will become a civilian state in which everyone will be entitled to their rights. These people led the country through very difficult times. They shouldn't be retired suddenly, and that is why President Morsi appointed Tantawi and Samyanan as his advisors. All these indications suggest that there is a desire to monopolize power by the Muslim Brotherhood and its Freedom and Justice Party, and they've become annoyed by the opposition. They now operate as the only political power in the country with the right to dominate all state institutions. Well, Ahmed Badawi, by and large, positive feedback uh, for Morsi's uh, decision. But there are also some, not only in Egypt but abroad, who are fearing that this decision is only the first step, if you will, to a dictatorship, to an Islamic dictatorship by the Muslim Brotherhood. Dictatorship is a very strong word. I think what we are heading towards, we've been talking all the time about the Turkish model, the Pakistani model, but there are two other models that might be very relevant now, which is the Indian and the Israeli model. There you had a, a ruling coalition, a ruling party, 
uh, which ruled for a very long period of time. And he, in Egypt, this might turn out to be the case because when we talk about the weakness of the opposition, uh, we have to keep in mind that this opposition is weak because there is no constituency for it. Uh, there is no modern, progressive middle class that is large enough that would be the backbone of a liberal, uh, secular opposition. Uh, if the Muslim Brotherhood do the right thing when it comes to economic development, over a generation or two, maybe we see the beginning of the birth of this modern, progressive, forward-looking middle class, which can then support a uh, credible opposition to emerge. Only then that we will have the kind of pluralist democracy that we are all aspiring for. But until then, we might end up seeing a democracy that is working, free and fair elections, but with one ruling coalition monopolizing power and capturing the state and continuing like this for a generation or two. Well, of course, we will see what kind of model will eventually succeed in Egypt. But Jan Kulman, because we talked about constitutional challenges, uh, the, the parliament, as we've said, is out of order, uh, if you will, by the decree of the previous uh, military leadership. Now, Mursi, uh, Mursi also in our key constitutional declarations made uh, by the previous uh, military uh, leadership. How do you think will the Supreme Constitutional Court now react to Morsi's decision? Well, um, I think nobody can say this. Um, but for me, another point is very important. Uh, whenever we talk about the Ikhwan, about the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt, we talk about the danger that Egypt is turning into uh, something like uh, religious uh, uh, dictatorship. Uh, something like uh, Mubarak, just uh, with another outlook. Uh, we shouldn't forget. We shouldn't forget that we had free and more or less fair elections in Egypt, and the people voted for the Muslim Brotherhood, and they voted for for the Salafi party. So, Morsi and the the Muslim Brotherhood, they have they have a democratic basis. It's not that they're coming out of nothing just because they are strong guys. Uh, they turn Egypt into a dictatorship. I mean, what we have seen now uh, is, is, is based in, in a democratic decision. But there is a and, difference. And I disagree with you. Mm. Um, I mean, I think that a lot of people are disappointed with what happened after the so-called revolution. But I don't think that the people just don't like the Muslim Brotherhood anymore. I mean, before the presidential elections, everyone said, OK, the people are disappointed with the Muslim Brotherhood. Morsi doesn't have any chance. He will be in, in, in second, third, fourth, fourth place. And what happened in the end? He won the elections. I mean, and in the end, we have to say Egypt altogether is a religious country. It is a more, I think it's, it's a rather, uh, in religious terms, uh, rather conservative country. We will see some kind of more conservative development. I'm pretty sure about that. But this doesn't mean that Egypt's going to be a, a, a religious dictatorship. But Morsi didn't, didn't, win, he didn't, win, he didn't win the sentence. election. He didn't just win the election because he is uh, a popular, or because the Muslim Brothers were popular, but because the people didn't want General Shafiq, who was affiliated to uh, the army. This is on the one step. Yeah, uh, being being elected democratically doesn't mean necessarily that you are a democrat and that you are heading towards democracy. And many models in the world has shown us that. Uh, a democratic election could bring about a new dictatorship like in Iran. I don't want to compare Egypt to Iran just not because the Muslim brothers are not willing to have a religious state, but because the economical situation in Egypt doesn't allow an Iranian model because Egypt is relying on tourism and foreign investors exactly. and not on oil like Saudi Arabia and uh, Iran. But on the other hand, we have to worry about and here I would like to disagree with Ahmad Badawi. The Israeli and the Indian models are based over or on secular traditions that we never really had in Egypt in this way. Secular tradition combined with democratic traditions. We don't have that in Egypt yet. This has to be settled down yet with the new constitution, with the new political culture that need to be established. But we are having now the Muslim brothers who are uh, trying to repeat the same scenario of the National Democratic Party of Mubarak by controlling the media, infiltrating the military, infiltrating the police, infiltrating the judicial institution. And that's institutions, and that's very dangerous because this could create a deep state, a new deep state, just like the one that we were fighting against 
and that's the one that what brought about personalities like Mubarak and Tantawi and Anan. Ahmed Badawi, well, do you share I, those concerns? I, I, well, to some extent, I, I was thinking more of the Indian and Israeli model from a sociological perspective yeah. rather than an ideological perspective. The, 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 the structure of society does not allow for the kind of pluralism that we are hoping for, not yet. Uh, and I also agree with you, uh, the West has to get rid of its paranoia of equating Islam with dictatorship. Uh, this is very Orientalist, uh, this is incorrect, uh, this is asking for trouble. Uh, so this is one point. Uh, regarding whether the street uh, uh, supports or does not support uh, the Islamists, of course, there is a great deal of support for the Islamists in the street. There is absolutely no doubt about this. Uh, but it is not enough for, it is not enough to allow the Islamists to monopolize everything. Of course, they are trying to capture the state. Any other party in the same structural position will try to capture the state. The question is, and I go back to the issue of the constitution and the judiciary, the next fight, the next big fight, will be between the rulers and the judiciary. And here there are two issues. Uh, for a long time, the Egyptian judiciary uh, has been calling for it to be independent. And I think there is a good opportunity now for the Egyptian judiciary to be independent. But before this happens, the judiciary will need to be burged somehow. Uh, some elements inside the judiciary, the corrupt elements inside the judiciary, will have to be taken out of the system, and this, they will not go down without a fight. Uh, now, of course, whether the Muslim Brotherhood would also try to infiltrate the judiciary, I'm sure they will. But at the end of the day, what really matters and the real fight is going to be over creating the right institutional environment that would make sure that all these players play according to some externally enforced rule. If this happens, we are on the right way. If it doesn't happen, we're in trouble. I would like to add one point, uh, because in your argument, um the Muslim Brotherhood or the, the Islamist powers always lead directly to something, a non-democratic state. I don't think this. I mean, it's, it's not that this has to happen automatically. I give don't want to say, I don't want to, I don't want to say that, that uh, the way of the Muslim Brotherhood leads to a perfect democratic state uh, tomorrow or in the next year or within two years. I don't want to say this. But what I want to say is that within the Muslim Brotherhood, you have so many different groups. You have so many different factions. And you especially have a, among the younger people who are influenced by what happens in the, in the rest of the world. I mean, they look at the other countries. The, the younger ge generation knows exactly that Turkey, with a more democratic uh, state, is in a much better position than Iran, for example. And they know exactly that the Saudi model doesn't fit to, to Egypt because they don't have the oil. It's a complete different country. And I mean, Egypt has had has had a, um, uh, uh, Egypt had a very very strong secular tradition in the past. I mean, you have had something like a secular ruling in the in the last sixty years, and even before that, you have had very very well, strong secular uh, tradition. So you can't say that there's nothing like a secular tradition in Egypt. That's definitely not true. No, but secularism on its own is not, is not a virtue. If secularism is not combined with democratic tradition, with institutions, then it doesn't have any meaning. We had many secular dictatorships in the world uh, too. And uh, uh, my problem is, yes, I am aware of the diversity uh, within the Muslim Brotherhood and I'm uh, aware that uh, people don't want to repeat the Iranian or the Saudi model, but still the Muslim Brotherhood the motivation, their motivation to go into politics is not to make the Egyptian economy better or to have a better life for the Egyptians. They want a better life for themselves, themselves and they have an ideological project. They have an ideological project based on religion and not based on political traditions. And we are seeing that. We are seeing that now. There is a demonstration, a huge demonstration planned for the 24th of August. We see one of the imams of the Muslim brothers is issuing a fatwa saying it is allowed to kill the demonstrations who are now against the rulers. The same, the same tragedy that we used to have in the past. The Muslim brothers are forbidding 
articles which are criticizing the, bro the brotherification of the media, but they are not criticizing an imam who is calling for killing demonstrators who are going in the streets in the name of God. He's saying because they are against God if they will go against the president. I'm not sure we can, we can make such sh sweeping generalizations and judgments about the motivation of the Muslim Brotherhood. It's an organization that existed for 80 years under very difficult circumstances. It's a very sophisticated organization. And we have to remember that at the end of the day, it is a political organization. It is a pragmatic organization. Uh, they are in power like any other political party that wants to be in power. I'm not sure we can say that they don't want, that they don't want the welfare of the people. This is too cynical. I mean, we can say that for any other political party in the world. Of course, they also want to have their own interest and to serve their own interest, but there is not necessarily a contradiction between serving one's interest on the one hand and serving the interest of the collectivity on the other. The balance will be maintained if we manage to have a credible constitution, if we manage to have an independent judiciary, and if we manage to make sure that the economy grows as quickly as possible. And I don't have many problems with having a deep state. Uh, a deep state is needed in a place like Egypt, as long as it is a deep state that has its rulers operating within a legitimate institutional environment and that there is a level playing field and free democratic elections so that at least there is an opportunity for these rulers to be punished by the people in case they don't deliver. Uh, we should try to normalize our understanding uh, of Egypt and think of it in straightforward political terms, there is nothing odd about what's happening in Egypt. But there is, it a, goes there is a difference between a deep state and a stable state. Deep state mm -hmm. means it is those who are in power are not, are not held accountable for what they do. That's what I meant. And that's what we had in the past under Mubarak mm -hmm. and under Sadat and under Nasser, that those who are in charge are I not meant accountable. A stable state. If this a is your definition, of course, state, this is not but what I meant. A, but it's not, that's not what we are seeing now. The Muslim Brothers are trying to control every single con, uh, institution in the country. Not that they make sure that it works. No, they want to put their men inside these institutions so that no one will hold them accountable for their mistakes. And that's what we are seeing now with such fatwas is the beginning of like making everyone silent who would criticize the new rulers. Well, Jan Kuhlmann, I think what we're seeing here is clearly a reflection, if you will, of the two camps or opinions widespread in Egypt, the deep distrust of the Muslim Brotherhood, whereas some people say, no, let's give him the benefit of the doubt first. Uh, what would you say? Which, which camp will ultimately prevail? Uh, that's hard to say. I think uh, we shouldn't underestimate the, the power of pragmatism within the Muslim Brotherhood. Uh, they are very pragmatic. I mean, they always say, oh, we are religious, they're talking in religious terms, but they are very pragmatic. That's why I'm, for example, I'm not scared that something could happen with a peace treaty to Israel. They know exactly how dependent they are on, on the support of the United States, of Washington. So they know exactly whenever they do something to the peace treaty with Israel, this will bring them a lot of trouble with the United States and with the, with the, uh, with the, with the other countries uh, in Europe. So I don't think that we will have any real deep problem with this. It's the same with tourism. So uh, they, will, they will not turn Egypt in a real religious state because they know they are dependent on, on what the tourists bring to Egypt, on the money. They know that they have, and this is where I completely disagree with you, uh, I think they have an interest to improve the situation of the people because they know exactly that the people, they have discovered the power. The people has discovered the power. And, and see what's happening in Tunisia right now. The people are disappointed. They go back to the streets. We have seen this in Sidi Bouzid a few days ago. This will happen in other cities in Tunisia. And, and if you are in Tunisia, you can see, really see it everywhere on the streets that the people are disappointed. And the same is going to happen in Egypt. So the, the real danger I see is that if the Muslim Brotherhood fails to improve the situation of the people, what comes next? So then we can talk about the Salafis. And, well, there I agree with you. I mean, there's no chance to have a real democracy with them. So um, 
I think the Brotherhood really has an interest to improve the situation of the people because they know exactly otherwise the people will turn against them. I think we are through with the Salafists. I think uh, the Salafists did the worst performance one can do in the parliament and uh, they are uh, having a lot of scandals right now. This is not the problem. And my concern is not the Islamization of Egypt, but the brotherfication of Egypt. So I know because of the economical situation, because of the temperament of the Egyptians, it's not possible to impose an Islamist state like Islamist state like in Saudi Arabia or, or in Iran. But it's very possible in this time of power vacuum that the Muslim brothers will go deeper and infiltrate the uh, institutions. And then once they are in fall, now they are just in the very beginning of their power and they are issuing such fatwas to forbid people to demonstrate. They came to power through demonstrations, but they don't want people to go to the streets to demonstrate against them, and they are just very f few months in power. What if they will take command of every single constitution uh, in two or three years? What if they will take control over the army completely and the police completely? Then they will, not, they will be a much worse dictatorship than that we had under Mubarak if they will not have a counter par well, a power which will oppose them. Look, of course, such concerns are very legitimate and they are very real. No one can argue against that. Uh, what we need or what I'm trying to say is that this is not because of anything inherent in the Muslim Brotherhood as such. Such concerns are legitimate and real because of the nature of the social structure and the political setup in Egypt. Of course, without opposition, and there is a vacuum, of course, the most powerful party will try to fill this vacuum. And if they do, of course, that would be something that would be really dangerous. What I'm saying is, let's try to be careful about what we wish for. Uh, let's not try to create self-fulfilling prophecies. Right now, this is what we have. We have to make sure that the scenario that you are worried about and that I am worried about and I guess all of us are worried about, right now there is no certainty that it will happen. We have to make sure that in the next few months uh, everybody who can make a contribution should make this contribution, not because I don't like the Muslim Brotherhood, but because for a healthy democracy to evolve, there needs to be countervailing powers. But I want to remind you, as Mubarak took power some 30 years ago, everybody was speaking like that, give him a chance, um, we should not be skeptical, um, he is new and fresh and he wants to change the country. And this skepticism was missing. Mm -hmm. And therefore, I consider my skepticism and the skepticism of many people towards the Muslim is a very healthy, Absolutely. and it yes. is something which is good for the pragmatism of the Muslim brothers, yes. that they know they are not having a free pass, and they are held accountable, and people are watching them. So therefore, yes. I would like to be disappointed in my own evaluation of the situation, but not disappointed in the future of Egypt. I also would like you to be disappointed, let's hope. <laughs> uh, but at the end of the day, the Muslim Brotherhood came into power with the votes of the people through an election. And in a democracy, you come into power with the votes and you go with the vote. So at the end of the day, doesn't it come, come down to what Ahmed Badawi was already saying, the welfare, at the end of the day, the economic state, of Egypt, if people don't feel that their living of standard has improved, the Muslim Brotherhood is out. For me, there are, at the moment, there are two crucial questions. The first question is the one with the constitution. So what we really need, and this is where we have to really look very closely to, is that there is something like a power sharing in Egypt. So that you have a government and that you have a strong opposition. And I agree with you, I'm a bit worried about what's happening to the media in Egypt. But uh, uh, still, we should give it a chance. I mean, it needs to develop. I'm, you can be skeptical, but there's not an automatic way to the, how do you call it, brotherhoodization of, the, of Egypt. Um, so you need power sharing in the constitution. And the next step is just the economy. Uh, so you have to improve the situation of the people. These are the, the main crucial tasks uh, for the coming years. And they will decide about whether Egypt is going to be a democratic state or if it's, uh, whether it's going to be a new uh, uh, dictatorship. Yeah.
I totally agree. Imagine this nightmare scenario that over the next five or six years, the Muslim Brotherhood manages to infiltrate the state, as you rightly say, and this is fine, but they fail to kickstart the economy. That would be a real nightmare scenario because then they would want to stay in power mm -hmm. just by their own brute force. If, however, they manage to kickstart the economy and the people feel that there is significant gain, then we'll still be on the fence. Uh, if there are free and fair elections, if they happen again, that would be absolutely fine. And then we're heading towards these models where you have